Right, hello and welcome to this week's angling vlog. This week you join me on the banks of the canal and we're in search of pike. So as you've seen at the start of the vlog, we did arrive on the canal in the dark. That is a tactic that I do quite a bit, especially when I'm targeting the canal when the boats are still busy. Getting on the canal in the dark, you can be ready for first light to cast in, so you're maximising that amount of time you're in the water, and also you get to see the canal come alive. In winter, when it gets colder and colder, seeing where them silvers are topping is essential. In my experience, you can be 20 yards away from pike or from the silvers, and that can be too far on some days. So that information that you do harvest first thing in the morning is really essential. Plus, it's a beautiful time to be on the bank. The rods are out behind me, the sun is just coming over the horizon, and fingers crossed, we can get one or two pike. But the session today is a short one. It's a Sunday morning. We're going to be fishing till about half past ten. It's about quarter to eight now in the morning. The rods are in. I've got one on a sardine, as you can see on screen now, and another on that trusty smelt. So fingers crossed, we can get a bite. The first one of the session, I'm making that effort getting up in the morning worthwhile. Only a little jack, but when they're small, they'll be better. And on some venues, it's just about working through these jacks, and then all of a sudden it'll go with that better one. Again, lovely colours, and let's get it straight back. Again on the sardine, and let's get it back out there. Well, a nice early take, that one, and good to get a pike on the bank. And say, size is irrelevant when you're on a campaign, and you can see there the sun is well up now, and losing that bit of heat that you associate with you know, winter, it's definitely cooling down now. So in previous vlogs, I've talked about boats on canals, and it's been quite a quiet morning since that first pike. Not much has happened, and then a boat's come through, and we started seeing that activity. The swirls coming up as these pike began to make the most of that extra colour in the canal. Didn't take too long after that boat had gone through to pick up this pike. One thing I have picked up for my piking this year is the super light mat from Corum. Perfect for your piking. I've had an 18 pound pike in it this year. Nice size to stop the pike getting off the mat and an excellent bit of kit. And a lovely pike. Let's get it straight back. So we no more bites forthcoming in that morning session. A few days later, I hit the banks of the river in search of pike. So today we are out in search of pike and as you've seen on the channel there's been plenty of content and that is because I am enjoying going out for the pike. You know you've got that grip between your teeth in the morning when you wake up you can't wait to get on the bank. So yeah this year I've got the grip between my teeth for the piking so hopefully there'll be plenty of content. So bait wise with the river carrying a bit of pace and a bit of extra colour it's all about smell for me today. So on one rod I've got a heaven section. And on the float, we've got a sardine. And when it is coloured, I'm a great believer in adding oils to your baits. I think it's a bit of a waste of money when it's clear, because the pike is hunting by sight. But when they're in coloured conditions and they're sniffing out a bait, that is when I will use the oil. Both rods are out. Just got to sit back, set up camp, and hope that that ledger fires off or that float begins to dance away. As I always say, one pike is the hope. And hopefully, that bit extra colour spurred the fish into life. You can see plenty of fish topping, so the silvers are about. Just got to hope that Mr Pike is about as well. So there's been a few questions about unhooking pike, and the number one thing is to be prepared. Here, got the mat set up ready, and like I said in other videos, there's been a few questions on it. It's the XL Super Light. And I've got all this stuff I need to unhook a pike. The bolt cutters if we need them. Pliers and some forceps. Now 90% of the time, they'll do. They lock in place. I've had them years and they're bulletproof. I've also had them years. They come with me every time. I might have only used them twice. 
but they're there if you need them. So yeah, the number one part with unhooking a pike is to be ready. You don't want to be messing around. The number one thing is concentrating on the pike. There is something magical about once the rods are out in piking, you're just sitting back and hoping that your plan comes together. But for a species that is so aggressive in the fight, it is ironic that the weight is so peaceful. It is two polar opposites, but as soon as that float starts to move, or that ledger comes alive, the heart starts pumping, the excitement gets going, and yeah, it really is a type of fishing that I really do enjoy. So that float on a sardine just started to pull away with the first take of the day. So that is how you want to start the day. Sardine striking again down the margin. I say, lovely colours. We'll give him a quick rest, we'll unhook him and then we'll take a look at him. Oh, well, like I said before, it can be quite calm piking and it can be absolute chaos. That's resting in the net and the ledge is just gone. So let's take a look at it. And like I just said, sometimes you can just be sat there waiting for the bite and others, it can be absolute chaos. Another small pike, with well, the second one, and he's snaffled a whole heaven section. <laughs> he's definitely hungry. So about 20 minutes ago, I said about the calmness of piking, and yeah, sometimes blogs come together to show it off. You went from absolute, you know, calm to carnage. That's the first one that come on the sardine down the edge and yeah he was resting in the edge and that ledger went off again if you'd have said which one come on which bait you would have almost certainly said that this one would have come on the sardine and that other one the heaven but no this guy was on the feet down the middle on that heaven section so by now the video with the sardines will hopefully have gone live on the channel you know showing you how i prepare them and keep them fresh and yeah that's from that batch though so it just shows the value of stocking up and yeah let's get it back out and see if we can tempt another these socks there's only one way we celebrate a capture like that two pike early on is with a celebratory brew the brew got us a bite this one's to celebrate it and so with piking like all fishing it can be a surprise at times and it can shock you but conditions wise that sun's come up clear skies some years you get freezing cold octobers this year very mild you're talking eight nine degrees and yeah there's definitely still some heat in that sun so i've been getting a few pike just swirling when i've been in the bait back in so i've just wobbled a bit with a float on a sardine back to me peg and the float's just buried fingers crossed they don't look a very big pike but hopefully we can get it in and like i said earlier there's quite a few at these small pike in the system at the moment like i always say with other species like the dace and the pike where there's chublets there's a river that's got a future and these are the future doubles of the river let's get him in and take a look it's been a quiet few hours just leaving the rods in situ decided to have a recast reeled it in and i saw this little guy swirl at the sardine just dropping it in the edge it didn't take too long for it to move off and it just shows at certain times of year, just adding that bit of movement to your bait can really pay off. No more bites were forthcoming on that session. A few days later, nipped back onto the canal, chucked out a sardine. It's not taking too long for this. What, eight, nine pound pike to snap that out. Great to be out. There's a bit of a chill in the air this morning. So yeah, the good times are coming. What we'll do now is we'll take a look at how I time my wire traces what the components are and how i put them together let's take a look at the components that i use to tie my wire traces now any of these can be replaced with things that you've got confidence in i'm just going to tell you the ones that i use in my setup so starting from the top of the rig you're going to need diamond eye swivels or a swivel i use the diamond eye ones simply because the um crimp cover at the end goes over the diamond eye a lot easier makes it just easier to make your traces when you're making them these are by far the best value for money that I've found for reliability and the amount you get for your money. Pack 100, 
You can say there's 50 traces there, isn't there? The crimp covers that I use on the bottom hook and on the top are the camo anti-tangle sleeves from Cordon. Just give a nice presentation to the rig. And yeah, I just like the way the rig looks at the end. The beauty of making your own traces is the customization and reliability, of course, but you can choose the right size of hook that you want to use and the distance apart for the size of bait that you're using or the water you're fishing. Size four is my go-to pattern and they're the ones that I use, the ones that I've got confidence in and I've used them for a number of years now. When I first started, I picked up a pair of crimps and a lot of things in piking, like your hooking tools and stuff like that and floats, have an investment in time. I've had them probably 10 years now and still going strong and still doing the job. Coming down to the wire, again, it's personal preference. When I first started, if you seen that in the bait shop, you picked up a spool. It was that good. And then they stopped making it. So for a couple of years, I was moving around wires and there was some that you had to burn and they were just hard work. And then I found this. By far, the best wire I've found since I stopped using that. Finally, you need a set of scissors or something to cut your wire and then a tape measure or something to measure out your first trace. And then of course, at the very end, you need a rig bin to put them all in. Well, let's make up a trace now. So the first thing to do is to measure out your wire for your trace. Now, I use my box, like I said earlier, so that's 12. And I want to start off with around about 21, 22 inches to end up with an 18 inch trace. So there's 12, pinch it, go again to 10. And there you go, you've got your 22 inches for your trace. And just cut it. So the first thing to go on is your crimp, like that. So you put your crimp onto your wire, pull it up a little bit out the way. The second thing is the hook. So through the eye, like that. The next stage is just to put the bottom end of the wire back through the crimp. So you get a loop like that. And what I do is grab the both pieces like that and then just push your crimp down. So that's what you end up with like that. So it's a case of simply putting the crimp in between the crimping pliers like that. Pull down nice and hard, not too hard. And what I do is turn it over and then just give it a little bit of a squeeze again. And that hook now is in place. And then it's a case of just pulling the wire at one end and that crimp over the end like that. So that's it in place now. You can see there how that anti-tangle sleeve just gives you a nice place for the hook to sit in a presentation. This is the bit that people struggle with. It's fixing this second hook in place. So you want to simply thread it onto the line at the top. However far apart you want your trebles, this is where you're going to decide. Like I say, I normally have them just about there. You want the wire to sit alongside the hook. You go below the hook, like that. So the wires come down the trace, behind the hook, and then you wrap around that hook three times. So you end up at the back of the eye and go straight through the back of the hook, backwards to front, pull, and there you go. That's the second hook in place. Going back up to the top end of your trace, you want to thread your line through the thin end of your anti-tangle sleeve because it's going to go back up towards the swivel at the top. You want to thread on another crimp and then you want to go through your diamond eye swivel at the diamond end like that. So that's what you've got at the top end. You've got your swivel, your crimp and then your sleeve like that. And it's just a case now we're threading the top end of the wire through the crimp so you push it straight through and then pull it up tight like that and just like at the bottom it's exactly the same the crimp between the crimp pliers squeeze down tight and then the other side and then release it and that is your top swivel in place then it's simply a case of pulling that anti-tangle sleeve up over the crimp 
and you can see there how easily that went over that diamond eye swivel and there we go that is a wire trace all ready to go so what are the benefits to tying your own trace over buying ones in the shop number one is you've tied it you've got the peace of mind that the components that have gone into it are ones that you've got confidence in and over the years you get to the point where it's, you know it's not going to let you down and it's one less thing to worry about on the bank but number two you can save a bit of money now you can see on this trace here i've got stuck on bottom the hook's bent out like it should so i've used a heavy setup so that hook is useless but on that trace there's a lot of stuff we can recycle so sometimes you can reuse the hooks you know if you've only just cast out and one of the hooks is bent I've been unfortunate on this one that both the hooks have bent out. So your wastage from the rig is two hooks, a bit of wire and two crimps. On every trace that you get back, you get them three things you can use again. And over time, saves your money. Like I say, you could reuse the wire for the smaller rig on a paternoster if you wanted to do that. And if you do it all the time, you save a bit of money. So the vlog does come to an end there now. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this vlog where we've been going out on that adventure for those pike. It has been a representation of how my piking's been at the moment. You know, short feeding sessions in the morning where you get a couple of bites and then quiet spells. We really do need them temperatures to drop a bit to condense those shoals, get those pike around them shoals and then I'm sure the results will be more consistent throughout the day. I hope that hint and tip on tying your own traces helps you out in your fishing. It's certainly something we've had a lot of questions on. So all that remains is to wish you guys tight lines in your own fishing. If you have enjoyed the video, please leave it a like and subscribe. And I'll catch us all next week. Tight lines.